Okay, I represent Pinellas County, and we'll go around the room and introduce my colleagues on this committee. Ah, thank you, Chair. Uh, Jeff Gow, City of Dunedin. Josh Schulman, St. Petersburg. Good morning. I'm Brad Miller, CEO of PSDA. Okay, thank you all. Not and now is the time for public comment. Do we have any members of the public want to speak? There are no public comments. Okay, thank you. Okay, now we'll go for action items. Do I have a motion to approve the May 19th meeting minutes? Move approval. Second. Okay, we have a, a motion and second. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, it's unanimous. Thank you. Now for action items. And each one. BJ Gavin, PSDA's project engineer, will explain the easement agreement with the city of Largo for an easement near Largo High School. BJ? Reflect that our chair went to Largo High School. Yeah, I did go to Largo <laughs> High School, uh, and no one could be prouder. Uh, not really, but um, it, it is what it was. And that was. Um, was it? It's about 10, 15 years ago, right? <laughs> no, it was over 50 years ago. 52. Commissioner Cox and Finance Committee, good morning. Uh, thank you for having me today. So this agenda item relates to an easement for the city of Largo. As part of our current bus shelter deployment program, planning and the project management office have identified a stop eligible for a bus shelter enhancement. So the stop location is adjacent to Largo High School. It also serves a transfer as a transfer location for Route 1861 with a nearby connection to the 52. So de to deploy a bus shelter at this location, however, the footprint of our existing stop would need to increase. We've asked the city of Largo for a 10 by 16 area, which currently is owned and controlled by the city. And they've agreed to, uh, to give us that, uh, that 10 by 16 area. So the action we're recommending here is acceptance of an easement from the city of Largo for a bus stop area proposed to exist partially on city-owned and controlled right-of-way. So here you'll see this beautiful plot of land on the left. Hopefully you recognize that as our, uh, our great county here. The star is going to indicate where this, this area is. And on the right, you'll see a, a zoomed-in portion. And so on the next slide, we'll, we'll look at an even better view of that. This area right here in red is the 10 by 16 uh, that, we're, that we are receiving from the city of Largo 
for uh, for that easement in, in that star area is, is obviously right where our bus stop's going to be. So uh, that, along with an existing FDOT right away, would allow us to enhance the stop with a boarding and a lighting area, a shelter pad, and a shelter. This has no fiscal impact, so it's it's for zero dollars from the city of Largo to pay to PSTA. And for those reasons, it's our recommendation the finance committee accepts this easement from the city of Largo. Any questions you have before this action? Mr. Shulman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, how, how close is this to the uh, high school? So this, uh, this is under, well, in this, in this view, uh, there's some construction going on the, on the top right here. That's the corner of Largo High School. Okay. So that kind of black fence looking piece and the white sand, uh, that's all that construction's finished, but that's the corner of the high school. Okay. And is, um, I don't know if you know this, is Largo, Largo's one of the high schools that we're gonna be testing with the Nelson County School? It is. Okay. Um, yeah, good, uh, good attention to detail there. Um, that is, I don't know if we have Heather on the Zoom. Heather can probably speak to that more. Um, she available yet? I can. Is she on the Zoom, Julie? She just joined. <laughs> so, well, if, uh, if, we, if, if we want to. We well, so I guess the, the really the next question is, you know, appro in, hey, sorry. Uh, approving the easement, mm -hmm. do we expect uh, construction of the shelter sorry. to be, what's the timetable for actually doing the work? That's a good question. Um, so, so easements, as, as we all know, can take a while. Now, we've hashed out a lot of that language already with, uh, with the city of Largo. So once we have the easement in hand, um, we're, we've got uh, construction drawings that we're working through right now. Uh, it should be a pretty quick turnaround. Uh, we would still have to get a permit from the city of Largo. So the, the timetable doesn't lie fully within our grasp, but, um, but there's, there aren't any known unknowns that, that we see right now. Do we, you wouldn't predict that it would be done by the start of school in August? It's, it's possible, it, uh, but I wouldn't say probable, but around that time. Okay. Um, right now, BJ, where's a bus stop that's close by to that bus area? Stop. So, Commissioner Cox, that is a bus stop currently. Okay. We're, we're just, we're enhancing it. Okay. So, so right now, I believe it has a, a semi-seat, which is a two-seater. Um, the, uh, and um, I don't even know if there is a full boarding and lighting area there, but, um, but it, it stops right there. Okay. And then, then what would our plans be across the street? Is there, is there a prop, is there a stop across the street right now from the high school too? Yeah, so this, this view is a little bit deceiving. Um, so I have on, on the bottom right here, First Avenue Northeast, just off of this, uh, this, this small map here, <clears throat> this is an intersection. So um, there, and then there, there's a, there is a, um, a signalized intersection below that within about mm, 400 feet. Mm -hmm. So that, that would allow somebody to cross over and that's, that's where the connection's happening. I don't know exactly where the uh, where the pair stop is to this, but I know I know within within that intersection, kind of 500 feet either way. There's a handful of stops. Right, and there's crossing guards there too. If I'm I think during school time, school games. hours, yeah, when okay. when, uh, when kids are traveling to school, I yeah. believe there is. Okay. This stop is just north of East Bay, right? And so it meets our threshold for ridership for a shelter because not only of Largo High, but also because of the transfers between the, the 52 that goes on East Bay and then the 18 that goes up and down um, this road. So it, or that's why I had, there is another bus stop right in front of Largo High, right in front of the entrance, just north of this picture, uh -huh. that, just, that doesn't have the same ridership uh, from yeah. non-students that this one does. So this, this has about nine times the ridership that the other one does. Really? But may, maybe once we start our program with the schools, because there is a uh, shelter pair, I mean a bus stop pair right across the street from me, right, right by Largo High. Um, that would be more convenient if there's a crossing guard for students. So we'll see. Okay. okay. Is, is this the bus stop that is primarily used for the UPass pilot program? 
if you can say there is kind of one stop, would this be it? I, I don't know, but I can tell you that that, that, that stop has the majority of riders. Um, if, if it is being used for UPASS, um, well, it, if either of the stops, the one directly in front, and, and that stop that, that Brad mentioned, uh, so the, the school frontage is along here. We're just at one end. The other stop is kind of it's, it's justified to the other end. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure where, where they're getting on and off. But like I said, this has about nine times the amount of ridership. So if you, if you split that up, maybe most students would be going here, but we don't have, I don't have information on how, how, you, how you pass splits up between those two spots. Is there, not that I've ever seen it, but will we see a design of the, the bus stop? Will that come back before us? It typically or? doesn't. Um, I mean, that's, that's something that, can be shared with you, or I mean, it, but um, it, it typically doesn't. When when we have uh, once we get the area cleared and it's it's uh, uh, and the easements given to PSTA, we move forward because we consider that our land now, or or, uh, or we consider it to be um, to be able without the committee's recommendation just to, to start. And, and, and we then, do have a fully engineered stop that would go in there. And, and and that makes sense. I would just suggest that. You know, given its proximity to Largo High, that you might reach out to them uh, on creating some sort of branding for Largo High as well, just to make it promotable for them, and to somehow, um, from a marketing standpoint, work with the principal <coughs> on letting the parents know that what we're doing to this bus stop to try and get the best use out of that U Pass pilot program. No, that's uh, that's to really make a big deal out of it. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great point, um, and we have been since since the infancy of this working with planning, uh, knowing knowing about that program that that was coming down the pipe to to say what can we do here? It, is there anything planned here? We're looking at this, and um, so so they are well aware. And I think I think through that channel of just that pilot program, uh, I think here and. Um, I know, I know we looked strategically in the county, I believe Gibbs is another, another one, but um, I think that that would work for this is all of those for, for, for any staff. And so I'll, I'll make sure that that is important. Yeah, and actually, to, to follow up on that, uh, looking at the map, um, I'm not sure if uh, Largo High School would actually prefer using this, this space, um, mostly because if they drop off at the one directly in front, then the students are going to have to be cutting across the parking lot. Um, which is also a car circle and, and drop off for parents. So you, you have a lot more traffic versus the stop that we're talking about here is connected to a sidewalk that then leads right up into the school. So, uh, but uh, you know, uh, to the point where we might even consider getting rid of the one right in front of the school so as to get the, you know, the kids into a safer, I mean, we talk about safer out to schools, you know, having them cross a you know, parking lot with cars coming in and out, you know, back and forth, or, or gathering at a spot that's right next to the parking lot is probably not the best idea, but having Largo High School um, and, and administration on board would be helpful in making, sure we're making the right call. Yeah, no, that, that's, a great, that's a great point. Uh, pedestrian access is something that we always look at when, uh, whenever, we're, whenever we're designing a stop, uh, considering that, that our, our people have to be able to get to the bus as well as get uh, get to where they're going, so we we do always look at that. But that's a great point about the other stop. Looking at having crossed that uh, that parking lot. So, any other questions before this goes to action? Do we do we have any software? Sorry for the C students in in the room. Uh, any software that that tracks individual buses live? And is there? Do we have the capability of? The students who might take advantage of the UPASS to actually be able to have an app yeah. that tells them the bus is going to be here in five minutes. Yeah, we, we do. And in fact, on um, at every stop, there's a small sign below our bus stop, uh, our, our big bus stop sign. And when you, when you when you're standing at a stop, there there are three ways that you can you can look at what bus is coming next. There's a text option that will tell you directly when the bus will arrive at that stop. There is a, a PSTA map, I'll call it map option, uh, 
think it's uh, ridepsda.net that will take you to a live map. You can actually look, you can watch the little buses moving so you could see a number of routes and how they're operating in real time. And then the other is our transit app. So um, there, there's, a, there's a, a small sticker on, um, on our map or on our signage that, uh, that tells you about our transit app. That's an app you can download and that uh, will enable you to map where you're going, where you're coming from, and it'll, it'll give you the route information and when it's right, real time. And so I might work yeah. with the school yeah. on somehow educating the students, although it shouldn't take much education <laughs> given their age, yeah. um, but, but how to use those apps. And I also do need to clarify that my reference to C students was not Margo High School, but it was me. <laughs> so, <laughs> don't want, don't need the students at Margo High matter. Yeah. Well, and I, and I think that, and, and another great suggestion, I think that will all work through um, the, the pilot program that planning's doing. Uh, just, they, they already have those contracts with the school. Uh, and so, uh, so that's, that's probably how that's gonna happen. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Mr. Chair, can I make a motion to approve bus shelter easement agreement with the city of Largo? You certainly may. Second. And we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 And the motion passes. Thank you, BJ. Good job. Thank you. And um, thank you for taking care of Largo High because it needs all the help we can get. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we'll go to the next move, which is information technology and communication contracts. We have Julie. Bagley Ospro and Al Burns. You're going to take us through the contracts. Julie? Yes, good morning, everyone. So, today we're here to talk about our very exciting mobile communication and internet broadband contracts. So, first, mobile communication, which is vital to our fleet operations and campus operations because it provides the Wi Fi, customer Wi Fi on the fleet, CAT ADL connectivity that tells you where the bus is and um, also our uh, Flamingo Fares Validator communication. And for the staff, it provides cell phone plans and tablet plans at the campus. Um, our internet broadband service provides uh, internet connectivity here at PSTA, but it also connects us to all of our terminals and allows us to share data, internet, whatever is needed. So um, items that you may want to know that would be important to you are that we uh, split our broad, our mobile communication amongst three vendors, currently AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile. This uh, provides for some resiliency and better pricing. Um, oh, I lost my place. Okay, so T-Mobile, you'll see, has the most activity. And the reason for that is they have acquired Sprint and we are consolidating the Sprint plans into the T-Mobile plans, and as well as, more importantly, they provide the most flexible plans and the best pricing. So that's why they have that big chunk of our activity. And um, the other thing that uh, of note of interest for you today is we're just asking to extend our Spectrum contract. And the reason we'd like to extend it is it expires in August of this year. And in the fall, we're going to connect the Sunrunner stations via Spectrum accounts, and we want that ability to ne negotiate long-term rates for those uh, contracts, those locations, when we negotiate our contract. So that's pretty much all I have to say, and now I'd like to turn it over to Al for the procurement. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Al Burns, your highly motivated procurement director. Good morning, Hi. Mr. Um, Good morning. As you know, prices have been escalating across the board on various services, goods and services that we uh, procure. So Julie and I, we, we, we spoke that we came up with a strategy on procuring this, these, um, these telecommunication contracts. And we selected to use the Department of Management Services or Florida DMS as a, has a contract method called SUNCOM. SUNCOM is providing superior telecommunication services more cost effectively to most local governments, educational, libraries, and non-for-profits. Non so in short, what we get by piggybacking or utilizing the Florida DMS contract is economies of scale. As Julie uh, spoke, she spoke, but there's also a matrix or a table um, in, on the action item that gives you the exact contract value. Uh, the fiscal impact, these upgrades will be funded with IP, IT's um, telecommunications services operating funds 
and they are part of our annual budget process. To go over the fiscal, fiscal uh, excuse me, to go over the sustainability portion, I'll turn it back over to Julie. Okay, so financially the plans are sustainable, sustainable because we do participate in these group contracts, which gives us very aggressive pricing. Um, for the economic vitality, I mean for the community wellness piece of this, it's this provides, these communication plans provide vital information for the fleet and um, also customer experience with the Wi-Fi and other amenities that are provided on board. And um, provides resiliency and some other factors too, but those are the main points that I would like to state. So Mr. Chair, yes, the, the action um, this morning, this morning before you is information technology contracts, mobile communication service and spectrum broadband. Action, recommend approval of five-year contract with T-Mobile for an amount not to exceed 600,000. Five-year contract with AT&T for an amount not to exceed 270,000. Five-year contract with Verizon for an amount not to exceed 180,000 and extending existing spectrum contract eight months until April 30th, 2023. If there's any questions, Julie and I would be more than happy to answer them. Alrighty, thank you. Thank both of you for your work on this. How about from um, the committee, do we have any questions? Mr. Shulman. Um, I don't have a question, I have a comment. Um, uh, I also uh, I appreciate um, and it, I didn't, it wasn't in the presentation. I just want to make sure it was just said out loud. The um, as far as the resiliency and the cloud-based, that uh, you know, T-Mobile, AT&T, and Verizon all use different cloud providers, uh, whether it's you know, Google or IBM or Amazon. So um, it, it's helpful if we're using a cloud base for resiliency that they're not all housed on the same servers uh, in the cloud. So if those servers go down, then we're, we're we have a problem there. So we. Um, yeah, I was, I, the, my, when I started looking at this, my original concern was that <clears throat> different names on the front, same back end um, protections, but they're all different. Uh, doesn't mean it can't still happen, but it's less likely being split up. So um, I'm, I'm pleased about that as well. No questions. No questions? Okay. Do we have a motion? So moved. Okay, we Second. Have we have a motion to approve the information technology and communication contract. Do we have a second? All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, aye. And motion passes unanimously. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we're with waste management and recycling services. Al Burns, again, will describe the need <laughs> to extend our waste management contract for trash and recycling for um, another month. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> um, just a little bit of background. Last month, I, I came to you. I'm sorry, my glasses keep falling yeah, up. Um, last month, I came to you, and I asked to add additional monies to the waste management contract. Everything is on, due to vacations, people taking time off, etc. We've had to extend um, that solicitation. Actually, tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, is the actual evaluation committee. But as you know, any contract, we ask for two things, not to exceed amount in a time, um, two years, three years, what, what have you. And this is just a, um, almost a parliamentary, this is a routine or administrative item just to add days so we don't violate um, procurement policy. <clears throat> Everything is on schedule. There's no fiscal impact or anything like that. So the recommendation is, I'm sorry. Recommend approval of a 30-day extension to July 30th, 2022 to Waste Management Incorporated for trash, refuse, and recycling services. I will say this, we're in a cone of silence, so if you ask me stuff, I, I see Brian looking at me, if you ask me stuff, I'm, I might not be able to answer them, but I can tell you we do have competition, and in procurement, that's defined as one or more, bit, excuse me, more than one uh, proposal, so we, we do have competition. If there's any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. All right, thank you. Commissioner Shulman. I don't know if you'd be more than happy. You just said you can't answer some of them. But uh, <laughs> the only question I have is um, on the background, you said that we've used 158000 uh, of our current budgeted amount um, with a cap of one hundred and sixty. Um, are we going to cross that cap 
in 30 days, or do we need to increase that cap a little bit as well? No, sir. Uh, um, I'm looking, and I'm sure my team is going to send me that information. Last month, we brought to you an increase. I want to say 80,000, but I, I don't want to. I don't want to um, misspeak. But okay, we, so that we added the... money to it last month, and we're nowhere near close to exceeding that amount. Okay. So that was the that was the amount last month. Yes. Yeah, so I wasn't sure seeing that the 160 here versus the 160 plus oh, yeah. the additional amount. So, okay, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure we weren't going to be back here no, you know, at the board yeah. meeting going, we need we need to add $5,000. No, sir. Uh, okay, thank you. Well, I don't think so. Okay. Move approval. Second. Okay, we have a motion to approve and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 And the motion is passes. We have one more month of picking up our trash. Um, and other services, recycling. Thank you, Brown. You're welcome, sir. Next. Oh, so here, here, here's, here's, here's where we go with the health benefits contract. Mm -hmm. And that's our final action item this morning. This is a large but important one. So we're going to have direct, Deputy Director Liz O'Hare of Human Resources and Debbie Leas take us through this item. Debbie? Good morning, everyone. And Good morning. Uh, today we're going to be talking about an action item for one of our largest expenses that we have here at PSPA. And that's our employee benefits insurances. And every year I come up here and we talk about it because we have to approve it every year because not only is it a large dollar amount, but we negotiate it <coughs> annually. And with me here today, I have Liz, our Deputy Director of Human Resources. So it's a pretty recent promotion, so congratulations to Liz. We also have Sean Fleming from the Gary Group. He is our uh, representative broker for the health insurances. So this year is the last year of a five-year contract that we brought to the board back in 2018. So we went out for a new procurement this year. So we went out for a competitive procurement this year. We received a lot of proposals across many lines of the insurances that we have, but the most interesting thing about this slide that I wanted to point out is the evaluation committee. On the committee, we had two SEIU union employees help us go through the evaluation and participate. Ben Kaus from maintenance and Ken Elliott, who's a union representative and also a bus operator. As an observer on this procurement, I can tell you they did their homework. And some of these proposals were a couple hundred pages long. They asked very pertinent and very good questions, and we really thought they were a valued member of the team. And to talk a little bit more, I get it. So as the majority of the committee members know, we have a three-tier premium uh, plan that we do here at PSCA. We have our buy-up plan, which is the um, employee pays a premium cost, so it is the most expensive plan, but they have the lowest deductible and out-of-pocket cost on that plan. Then we have our base plan, which the majority of our employees are currently in. It has a slightly higher deductible, um, but it has less uh, premium cost on it. And then we have our high deductible plan, which is includes our free option to the employee. Um, it has the same deductible as our base plan, um, with again that free option to the employee and much lower monthly premiums. And it can also be partnered with a health savings account that the employee can make um, tax-free contributions to. Okay, thanks, Liz. One of the things that uh, came up was we had four proposers from major providers for the medical insurance as well as pharmacy. And out of those four, two rose to the top, Aetna and Cigna. The evaluation committee ranked Cigna higher than Aetna. One of the main reasons for this is out of the out-of-pocket costs that we have on the pharmacy. You can see from the chart up here that Cigna has a much lower out-of-pocket cost than Aetna. In addition, 
We have a lot of people on various medications here at PSDA. 13% of the medications that our employees are using were not on the Aetna plan. In addition, there were some other minor things that were uh, a little bit higher as well on Aetna. Now, what I want to talk about and what's important about this slide is where we are landing from a financial aspect. When we started to put the budget assumptions together, we took a look at what's happening in the industry. And we had anticipated a 9% increase in the health insurances. When we received the proposals, uh, Cigna came in at about 6.9%, which was a lot lower than what I've seen them come in just across the country. And when we negotiated with them, we got it down to 4.5%. So what does that mean to our employees? Well, as Liz said, our high deductible plan will have no change at all in the premiums to our employees. We will still be contributing to the health um, HSA savings account, and we're spreading 4.5% amongst the buy-up plan and the base plan. And what I think is really important and sets PSTA apart is that our high deductible plan is free and it is very good at the very rich um, insurances that we have here. And very few people have free insurance offers to our employees. And that's for our single members of which most of our employees fall into that category. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Liz so you can hear what it looks like to the employee on a day period. And you all have the <coughs> packet. This is just kind of showing exactly what Debbie said, what this means to the employee. So as you can see, there's only a slight increase to the employee um, monthly premium or per pay period premiums um, with this 4.5% increase. And as Debbie said, and we can't stress enough, that high deductible for the employee only would continue to be free along with PSTA still making, in that last column, those annual contributions to the health savings account. All right. And along with all of that, we will still be making, we will still have all of our healthy incentive programs going on. Um, one of the, the biggest ones, not counting biometrics, which most employers have, but one of the ones that I think makes us unique is our Fitbit program. We have opened it up to all of our employees to be able to receive a discounted Fitbit, uh, and then we are still contributing up to $3 a day for the 10,000 steps and 30 minutes of activities to the employees in the high deductible health plan if they are members of our PSTA Fitbit group. Um, and our newest incentive that I wanted to point out is we have made our on-campus gym available free of charge to all of our employees. Now to move on to dental. Uh, we did receive eight proposals for dental with Sigma coming out on top for the PPO for their PPO and DHMO. Um, there would be no cost increase to the employees with the Sigma dental, uh, and we would still be offering a free dental plan also. For the vision, there was also eight proposals. Um, Versant MetLife, which is our current provider, did come out on top for that also with no changes to the employee, no changes to the coverage, and we would still be offering that free of charge to the employee. And then our basic life insurance, and this is kind of the exciting one, as I'm sure you guys can see on the screen, it always excites Debbie. We had seven proposals, and we are recommending Ocho's Midlife, as there was a savings to PSTA of just over $31,000 in the basic life insurance, along with no changes to the employee's added life insurance. So now I'm gonna pass it back to Debbie. All right, the action <coughs> item before us today is to recommend approval of the fiscal 23 various health insurance lines. As we just talked about, the medical pharmacy would be Cigna for $10 million. Dental would be Cigna, $200,000. Vision with first insight met life for $50,000. And optional life and APD with OGES Minnesota life for $70,000. Because of the dollar values related to this, we, while this is a two-year with three one-year options that so we're asking to have Brad be able to exercise those options, he cannot do so without us coming back to the board every single year. And the reason for that is because the annual amount is negotiated every single year. And the contract allows for us to get out of the 
contract at any point in time should we see any significant changes that would determine we need to go back out for an RFP. So with that, I'll open it up for questions. <coughs> Mr. Shulman. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first off, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to Al, I'm guessing, uh, the scoring chart in the packet uh, for all the, the different uh, um, vendors. Uh, was it was very helpful to, to see where the, the the team that was evaluating the evaluation committee came down on, on the different um, aspects as opposed to getting the raw score so I know I asked for it so I just wanted to highlight the fact that I, I saw it I noticed it and it was helpful appreciate it. Um, I did have a question about the high deductible health plan um, we talked about the cost not changing what are the deductibles going to be we're going from something to something the deductibles are not changing on the high deductible health Okay, so, so it'll be for a single fifteen hundred, and then for a family three thousand. Okay, mm -hmm. that is that is fantastic, and that is yeah. exceedingly low. Yes. Yeah. Of exactly. Considering a high deductible health plan. <laughs> yes. Um, I don't want to make it seem like it's not nothing, but it's not. It, it is very beneficial. Um, so then the next question I have this really isn't about the health plan necessarily. It, it's about our contributions to the HSA on behalf of employees, right? So. We contribute three hundred dollars for a, an individual, and four hundred twenty-five for an employee plus one ish, or five fifty for an entire family. But the deductibles are double. For right, a, a single is fifteen hundred. For two people, it's three thousand. Fifteen hundred each. So it, it's actually less valuable for. It, it, it's 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 not equal, right? So we're not we're not equally covering those deductibles for family members as we are for the employee, um, and and I don't know necessarily, the, and I, I think I mentioned this last year as well, uh, but I, I don't know the rationale behind that and whether that that makes the best. I'm sure Brad would be delighted if we raised it. Look for family, Google. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like the only family. I think there's not too many families. But so we can take we can certainly take a look at that and amend the budget to well, I, because it it may incentivize more people. That's well, what you're saying. so it may incentivize more people, which is generally good. Um, but even if it doesn't, it makes sure that uh, those families that we're covering are equally covered between yeah. either themselves and their spouse or themselves and their kids um, versus what's here. Uh, and I would. I would imagine it's probably not that much. I don't know how many folks we currently have on the high deductible health plan. It's our second most utilized plan in uh, PSTA, and I believe we have. Most people though in the same. Right, so then the, the next, thank you. The next question would obviously be, what, well, how many of those are are it's a, it's plus about something? About 150 employees, and the majority yeah. of them are in the employee only category. Yeah. Okay. So if we're talking, let's just say if it's a majority, let's just say a third of that, so 50 families, we're talking about you know $175 more for 50. That's not a huge budgetary item, but I believe that right. it's more equitable for what we're, what we're trying to do as opposed to disincentivizing uh, anyone who's not just the employee only. Okay. Um, I agree. Right. The, <laughs> and unfortunately, I had another question, but I didn't write it down because I was also listening, so it may come back to me. Uh, We'll be here. If we cover other things. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Chair. Mr. Uh, yeah, within your the, the medical plan, is there any negative impact or hindrance uh, regarding women's health care and what's available to them? No. no. You're aware of? No, preventative services are still. And, and or transgender? Absolutely not. I don't think there's any negative impact. Okay. Thank you. That was it. No questions, Mr. Cho. Mr. Chair. Commissioner Shulman. Redirect, Your Honor. Um, <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, I know this is the, the, you know, specifically the health, the dental vision, uh, life, um, accidental death and dismemberment, which is <clears throat> an interesting topic. Um, do we, and I just don't recall, do we have a short term and long term disability, and is that covered in a separate? Those are supplementals that we offer. Okay. We do offer the supplementals um, currently for the short term is Aflac, and our long term is the Hartford. 
Okay, and, and the with employees the employees have to pay. Yes, the employee pays for because it's a supplement. Okay, so we don't offer any short-term disability mm -hmm. as an agency. Okay, um, and have we looked? Um, and I, I don't know the official name for it, but um, other supplementals that might cover uh, like indemnity plans or things like that that would cover. Uh, you know, if there was cancer or some or, or some specific illness that there's there's funds that come back is that an option as well for the, employees yeah the employees have two different supplemental options they can um, Aflac and Washington National and they both provide cancer policies hospitalization policies um, accident policies that sort of thing but it is at full cost to the employee okay doesn't provide anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so PSD doesn't provide anything but do we negotiate those for the employees or do we just or are we just sign them up as a this is the vendor you can use through our payroll system. It's just a vendor that they can use through the payroll system. Okay. We allow the uh, AFLAC uh, salespeople to come in quite often, and they're smoothly we like really good salespeople. Yeah. <laughs> they they get are, a lot of employees to sign up. Well, and, and, and uh, without without you know picking or choosing one particular vendor, I just wanted to make sure that um, we're we're talking about. I was understanding what the complete potential benefit yes. package looks like and whether we're in, you know actually working on um, reducing those costs um, and when we discuss the high deductible health plan with our new hires we always include the supplementals that they could also go out and help themselves while being on a high deductible health plan so when we offer those additional vendors do we go out to any sort of procurement as far as who we would allow as a supplemental or do we just how do, how do we select those vendors i think we did yeah, i think we not recently, but we did. Okay. I think the last time you brought this up to offer more than one, we did. Okay. It'd be interesting um, to make sure that we're at least doing that on a appropriate cycle, whether it's every three years or five years going back out, uh, just like we do with others, just to make sure that even though we're not paying for it, since we are the conduit for our employees to do so, I'd like to make sure that they're getting uh, the, the, the best treatment that they can as well. All right. I'll check on it because I don't think it's been five years. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Rob. Commissioner Gow. Your question. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Jones, you're good? Yep, I'm good. All right. Do we have a motion to um, approve? Mr. Chair, I make a motion to approve the fiscal year 2023 employee, employee health benefits. Okay. So moved. Or second. Okay. So moved and a second. I don't play around. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, motion passes. Thank both you for your hard work. Yeah, great job, as always, every year. It's always interesting, and uh, this year it was a combined deal between procurement and the Gary Group on, on those two questions. A lot of reading. I know. Jeff Gow, <laughs> Debbie Lewis, and Hen oh, Jeff Gow, comma, <laughs> Debbie Lewis <laughs> and Henry Lukasik will provide some information on the financial benefits to PSTA's conversion to an electrified bus fleet. Debbie? All right. Thank you so much, and thank you, Commissioner Gow. We had a great discussion after the executive committee meeting, and Oftentimes when we talk about some of the challenges that come up through the budget process, such as fuel, there's also a very good benefit that comes out of it, that it's a good news story of what PSTA has the foresight to be doing. Because I'm sure... Budget presentation, prices seem to be going up and up. 
And when we take a did I do that by myself? <laughs> 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 it worked. It's not the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> I get so excited on these little things. Um, the, the market for fuel has been extremely, as you know, extremely volatile. When we look at the market prices on fuel, we have seen during the course of this fiscal year that they've gone up from $2.57 to $4.35. We have locked in some pieces during the course of the year, as you can see on the, on the slide, it's some varying prices, but it really is going to have an impact on our budget for next year. The fuel prices, because they're going up, will be 63.5% uh, higher in next year's budget compared to the $2.30 we had budgeted this year. So what are we budgeting for next year? $4 a gallon at this point for the diesel fuel and $3.40 on the unleaded. It's cheap. And um, well, we get to <laughs> It's untaxed. <laughs> we don't pay no tax. tax. Oh, I got you. No tax. Right. No tax. And what we do from a strategic level is that we tend to lock in fuel prices and I'm waiting. We do it in a consortium with ARC. And they will be taking this to their board in June, next week, June week. 22nd, I think. In addition, within that contract, we've also asked for the ability to lock in unleaded fuel, not just the diesel. One of the good things about, if there is a silver lining, one of the good things about a very bad economy, looking at recession, as different things are slowing down, you also see the fuel prices dropping as production is down. So when the forecasters are looking out and we're looking out into the next year, you can see a downward slope as we go forward. So we will be over the summertime looking to see what we can do to get in below that $4 and $3.40 gallon. And <coughs> part of the importance of this is we have between PSTA and our partners a lot of different buses and vehicles. So we are currently paying not only for PSTA, but for First Transit. And for the first time in the fiscal 23 budget, we will be paying for the Jolly Trolley buses, which is basically the unleaded at the 25 buses that they've got guaranteed, you know, for us here. So one of the things that we want to do is look at the impacts that this has on PSTA. I'm going to let Henry talk about the next couple slides. Uh, so the next couple of slides, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some performance metrics, uh, what our current fleet is doing, of course what our electric fleet is doing, and then we'll talk about some uh, uh, cost forecasting. So as you know, we still got quite a bit of older diesel buses. We hope to get these out of here ASAP because they are getting up there in years. And you'll see that this averaging about 4.54 miles per gallon. That's actually pretty good by industry standard, and we equate that to good maintenance. Um, hybrid electric buses, uh, as you know, PSDA's had these since, sorry, 2009. We still have them. And we're seeing about 5.51. We have two different generations of hybrid electrics. Um, the latest one is a series electric, which we like to say is like an electric bus, but it has an onboard generator. Now, electric buses, this is, gets into a new way of measuring how well they do. This is kilowatt hours per mile, and you're going to start seeing this as we get more and more electric buses. So 2.35, remember, the lower that number, the better the bus is performing. Simply speaking, the less energy it takes to do something, the better off you are, the more efficient it is. We even, way back, always set a benchmark standard of approximately 2.5 kilowatt hours per mile. As you can see here, we are in the height of summer, uh, and we're doing better than that, 2.35. It is not uncommon when the temperature drops, it's a little cooler out there, that we actually see 1.80, which, which is very good. Now, that number is influenced in with all electric vehicles on four fundamental factors. 
route profile or duty cycle, what is the bus doing, how fast is it going? Terrain, flat, hills, passenger load, how, how many people are on the bus, which equals weight, and of course the environment. Is it subtropical weather like ours, or is it the Arctic zone like up north? So fortunately, and I have said this over the years, is that Pinellas County, where we operate, these represents one of the best of all those factors. We have relatively consistent climate. We don't have hills. Um, our passenger loads are generally consistent, and our route profile is generally the same. So all that things being equal, if, I, if we were uh, up north, or say San Francisco, where we have large hills and it's 40 below zero, I'd probably not be saying that number was very good because those are power grabbing uh, type impacts to electric buses. Now, for those that have been on this committee and board, you probably remember some of the early on discussions of yep. electric buses and mm -hmm. back in 2017, you asked me to look into my crystal ball long before we had electric buses and said, Henry, what can we anticipate with saving? So here we are approximately four years later, okay, and we have started accumulating good data with our six buses in service. And before this meeting last night, as I was penning some notes, I did go back to some of those early on discussions and take a look at what I told you back then, and believe it or not, these numbers really have not changed uh, between then and now. If I was a fortune teller, I would not be sitting here. I'd be predicting the next Powerball number, saying. <laughs> but it is, it is good to know. Now, for those that remember some of the early discussions back then, when we look at this, we break it out by, of course, diesel and cost per kilowatt hour. We're going to call that propulsion cost per mile. Because remember, we're looking at diesel fuel and we're looking at electricity. And there's those numbers right there. Basically, our vehicles do an annual across the board 55,000 miles per vehicle per year. We use the diesel standard and that uh, kilowatt hour per mile. So that's what you can see in annual quote fuel cost. Maintenance cost per mile. Now, as I uh, alluded to just a few seconds ago, some of the early discussions from years ago was, Henry, that cost per mile is abnormally low. That's not possible, right? There's two factors for that. One, in order to illustrate a point, okay, with cost per mile based off a of particular vehicle type, we only look at parts cost, labor cost, okay? We don't want to skew that data with every little nut or bolt or roll of paper towels that we buy. That's a whole different cost per mile. That's called fully burdened cost per mile. So, Number two is, to this day, the industry average for annual miles per year for a transit bus is 35,000 per year. As you can see, we are at 55,000, which is just about double. That is true. Uh, PSTA does run two times the industry standard of annual miles per bus. So the more miles, right, the more the costs are spread out on an annualized basis. So all those numbers added up at the end, you'll see our cost per mile, and you will see the estimated annual savings per bus. It is a known fact that most of your savings is going to be generated from fuel. Electricity right now is much cheaper than a gallon of fuel, any fuel. Even if fuel was $2 a gallon, which we hope goes back to that, electricity here for us in Pinellas County will still be cheaper. The other reason for lower cost per mile is simply less moving parts. So the typical engine and transmission has well over 1,800 mechanically moving parts that can wear out the need to be replaced. The typical electric bus has 50. 50 parts that move to make it go. So there's a lot
lot less maintenance and if there's a lot less parts to wear out. Number two, electrified accessories are much more efficient and reliable than their mechanical belt-driven counterparts. Remember, power steering pump driven by a bell, AC compressor air, all power robbing components that can wear out the world. It doesn't exist on an electric bus. So that's why it's lower to maintain than a diesel counterpart. Now the last slide, Debbie left it up to me whether or not I wanted to hand it back to her, but I decided I'm gonna be selfish and I'm gonna take it. <laughs> <laughs> Last but not least, our final slide here, strategic planning and sustainability, but for all of those four bullets that you can add, see on your screen, I want to add a fifth. And I'm actually pretty proud of this one, is the fifth one is experience. For 12 years, the STA has had the experience of running buses with high voltage propulsion systems. For us, Operators know how to drive electric buses, and the Fleet Maintenance Division knows how to maintain those buses. So, taking electric buses and transitioning them at PSTA is a natural step forward, rather than a leap into the unknown, like some of our other colleagues in the industry that are just now getting their first electric bus while they may have just been operating a traditional diesel. So experience is key, and when you have experience, that just adds to being sustainable, which is part of our strategic plan. And with that, there's the blank screen. <laughs> Great job, Andrew. Great job. I'm happy because I don't always get to present with Debbie Lewis like this, so I'm happy to answer any questions. That you sure. Can I go first? Or yeah, you, you want to go first? No, we're oh, absolutely. Gonna, <laughs> we're going to give it to the mayor. So, in your presentation, Henry, I got one question. I don't really have many questions. You know that. You mentioned the bus the flat, no hills, but the AC, does the AC cooling the passenger, does that, does that cause any more energy? Because you didn't really say anything about the, the cooling of it. You, you mentioned up north where it's 40 below, but you didn't mention when it's 95 here. So when we compare generating conditioning mm -hmm. versus generating heat, yes, air conditioning does consume energy but it is much less than how you create heat. Heat is still created by applying electricity to a metal coil and heating it up, which is very energy consuming. So, yes we see, uh, as, as I pointed out, 2.35 is typically what we will see in the height of summer. It, pretty bad out there right now, it's probably gonna get a lot worse um, so that's where you see that kilowatt hour per mile rise. If I was having this com uh, presentation, say, back in this past January when it was wonderful, it was 50, I'd probably say that number was about 1.75, 1.8. Perfect. So the other thing is the presentation, I actually think you convinced me to buy an electric car. <laughs> And I always told myself I would never buy one, but because of you, I'm probably going to buy one now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for buying all that. I probably will, too. I still drive a 2005 Ford Explorer, um, and that's not too brand specific, but I hear there's a new pickup truck. That that was was the no, I don't know. Commissioner Schumann. Thank you, and thank you for allowing me to go after the mayor. Um, <laughs> so you're using 2.35, you use that in the analysis of, of the current cost. Um, so that's the worst case, what you're saying, because we're running at 2.35 now with the AC running um, in those conditions. 
Um, have you looked at what the average is for the year? Average for the year is about 2.0. Okay. For our future forward uh, analyses, for example, uh, these are our six BYD buses. Uh, as you know, we're getting Gillick buses coming in, they're on order. Uh, we have set that uh, at 2.50. We do believe that we can achieve better than that based off their configuration. Okay, so there's about a 15% then savings from the numbers you use in your in your right. In and your there's team. also been uh, since 2018 when we received our first two BYDs, there has been that many years of battery improvements. The batteries on the Gillig buses is the new Ecosol packs, which forced the same battery pack. It has 38% more capacity built into it. Um, so uh, another question would be, um, so this is just general annual operating costs from fuel and maintenance. How do we compare the, the, the two when we talk about you know, rebuilds or replacing a battery pack? So that's where the experience factor comes in. Uh, as some of you may have heard in previous uh, conversations that fleet division right now has the ability at a significant cost savings to rehab, rehabilitate, rebuild the existing high voltage battery packs on our hybrid electric buses. A relatively probably at 50% less cost than we would spend if we had to go out and buy those pre-made. So, because the hybrid electric buses have similar or same type components, high voltage batteries, inverters, such as that, that knowledge has been attained over the years. We still believe that we can rehab those buses at midlife or when it's necessary at that same cost save. So, so we're anticipating that there will be continued cost savings, uh, even with the electric compared to a diesel. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, and thank you, Commissioner Gow, for asking for the uh, review. Oh, thank you. Isn't it wonderful? The, this is. Let me add uh, one last point. I'm telling that. myself it just popped in there. Okay. As uh, no uh, diesel engines have over the years come under significant emission requirements. So those engines now have very expensive exhaust after treatment components on them. So uh, those components don't exist on an electric bus. So we talked about previously rebuilding the engine, the transmission, the drive line, the batteries, the inverters, right? I'm talking about a hybrid bus, electric bus, we have the batteries. We might have some wheel end traction motors. That's your overall. Next slide, Sam. Okay. Any more questions? Henry, I have a question or two. Um, now, I know we operate Route 11 very frequently with electric buses because it goes right by my house. And it makes sense, long route, mostly straight, uh, ends up here so it can use it in ground charger. What other routes are we using electric buses on? We have, uh, and I'm going to ask Mr. Greg Bracken real yeah. quickly to help me. What is the route that goes up and down 19? That's the 19, right? Okay. Uh, as you know, I live up in Tarkin Springs. Um, I have seen the electric bus doing the 19. We actually did a couple trials on it to, to see what it would do, it flex its legs. Uh, as you know, we did a circulator downtown St. Petersburg. Right. Um, we are putting it out there uh, in various routes to collect data. I believe we did have it once on uh, 275 to, to see what it could do. Uh, obviously, once we start getting more and more electric buses, we'll see them more on other routes. And then on the horizon, we have another in-ground charger coming somewhere. Have we made a decision on where that may be yet? 
I believe that's still in the planning phase um, as we work through the paperwork finalization to get all of those grants uh, approved and in the work. So still, still mapping that out. Okay. And yeah. then, then I want to ask about the fuel. Um, it was mentioned the fuel for First Transit in, in Jolly Trolley. Do we pay for their fuel or do they, we pay for that? We do. That was part of the contract that we would take on the fuel expenses for First Transit. And when we negotiated the contract extension for Jolly Trolley, we said we would do it in the second year of the contract, which is starting October 1st. Are there any concessions for high, you know, raising the rising fuel prices right now to our vendor? Or not? We're taking on all that. We're taking it all in their behalf. Yikes. I know. Well, we, we did put in a provision that would, uh, for purchase, for, I think it was Charlie put purchasing electric uh, mm -hmm. uh, buses Trolleys. going forward. So yeah, 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 yeah. that was yeah. one of the mitigating factors was saying, you know, let, let's start converting some of your fleet. All right. So we're just at a very unfortunate time right now based on. It's very nice of you, Brad. But you know what? By the time we finish our five years, by the time we finish our five years of the uh, buying the zero emission buses, you know, the 60 buses, yeah. we will have actually about 70 in the fleet at that time. So between that and what we currently have as our hybrid fleet, we will be about 50%, I will call it electric. Okay. And Henry, one quick question. When we get rid of the 2006 buses, do I still see them out there? Uh, well, fortunately, Commissioner Cut, but the word goes. <laughs> You're going to see them for a few months. Well, I, I more saw, years. I saw um, one of them. The, with a new paint job on it, which, you know, which we quite like. Um, actually, I guess they removed all the other stuff because it was kind of blank except with the PSA. Me, me, me. So as you know, we've got 14 uh, on order right now with Gilly. Right now, that delivery timeline is we will see our first one in November of this year. That oh, good. Be the first article. I have to actually get on a plane and go to California, take a look at it. Uh, another uh, six will go into production April 2023, and the remainder will be September 2023. We are currently working on submitting uh, an order for another 24 to secure our production slots, um, and we're awaiting a more finalized date as to when we're going to see those. But there is no one except for you, other than me, who wants to see those 2006s <laughs> off the road as soon as possible. No, I'm not saying they don't even really look that bad, but I know what year they are. Anyway, it's like your 2005 Explorer, or what do you got, a Escape or a Explorer? It's a Explorer, yeah. It's got yeah, yeah. <laughs> 200,000 miles. There you go. And it looks Thank brand you. New. That's all I right. have. I do have a question, if you don't mind. Um, we talked about the, the Jolly Trolley. Uh, is there any indication on when that first purchase might be made? I thought it was coming up soon in the year. Right. Uh, so we, as you know, we have a fleet of hometown trolleys, and we have been uh, working with them. They have their electric trolley that is currently going through Altoona testing. Altoona testing is this challenge course that proves, supposed to prove how long a bus will last in service. Um, that hopefully will have something that is approved to use federal money. Must pass the test. Uh, I hope I win this this year. I think in the July July contract we have the ten year contract it was in year two. You're supposed to get their first electric. And it was supposed to time with the testing. Yeah. We just got a bunch of trolleys <clears throat> during COVID, remember? Didn't we have a bunch of come in? The SDA got some too, yeah. yeah. Right. Those are not electric. And yeah, then not electric. and then just a comment of thank you all. I think this has been just a wonderful presentation. And I don't know how you would do it, but I think there's a lot of wonderful marketing positive spin that you've taken out of this to put on social media to just the more we can beat our own drum and tell the public how wonderful public transit is you know, especially when we move in this direction you know and you incorporate that with right aren't we are we still at half fares because of gas prices 
Uh, we were. We were. We are so not. We are not now. Okay. Yeah, we're coming up on the 25th and 26th, no fares. What? Yeah, there's no fares. At least no fares downtown at St. Pete. We waived the fares because of Pride. Oh, well, that's just oh. on the Pride services. Okay. Yeah. Good one. Um, just, uh, um, you know, with rising gas prices, a wonderful, Excellent. positive marketing campaign that yeah. it, for the pain at the pump for the individual. Thank you for Here's what your money goes to with public transit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah thank you for suggesting so, uh, Mayor, you said that um, you were so inspired by Henry to maybe look into an electric vehicle. So, uh, I guess none, we're, none of us are really confident in Debbie's uh, bold prediction that the prices are going to start going down. They're not going down. <laughs> I'm only going by the forecasters in the market who know a little more than I do. But yeah, they're not going I'm down. I'm actually going <laughs> off the, the NYMAX and also articles and things. Of and, and what was it again? I know you mentioned it, but what was it again that would drive that price down? Basically, you know, as the economy is slowing, you know, different okay. production, different things will be slowing. Hopefully, people will be coming on to our PSTA buses instead of driving their cars. I mean, there's a lot of things, and it's not just here. It's a whole global economy issue. Um, but that is driving the prices down, and I've been watching for, well, I watch every day. But I've been watching over the last week, prices dropping on the NYMAX, and I cannot wait until we can get the ability to lock in for the future years. And then, and then Deb, um, as soon as the HART approves the, the contract for the, for the future, are you able to then lock in, like, we out into like 2023 when the yes. price is down at those yes. low prices? Yes. Okay. And we typically lock in, just so you know, about two-thirds of our fuel when we do a lock-in. And the reason being is it leaves you one third to float to the market, so you're you're sort of mitigating your risk to the budget on two thirds of it. One third you still have the ability if prices drop again to lock in more, yeah, um, you know. But you're kind of that's that's the hedge you've got. But you're leaving yourself a little opening in there to go ahead. And we used to lock in at one point 100 percent of our fuel here, and then you'd see the prices drop. And then you're like, dang it, I locked in 100%. <laughs> yeah. So and, and our quarterly reports that we do on fuel, you know, I try to look and say this is, it's almost what I would call a mark-to-market report. We mark ourselves against our decisions, against what the marketplace is doing. So I always show that in there to say, was it a good decision or was it a bad decision? And, and that's not just to our budget, but as a whole in the marketplace. And then my only one more ask with this is if this can be put on the, the board agenda so the entire board can hear this as well. Yeah. That's a good answer. Henry, why we still have you? I have a, a, one more question. That's that feel. Yeah. Like Colombo. Um, That's a green. Reliability That's so far on our electric buses, breakdowns, what's our reliability? 90%, 99%? Hundred percent. I wish it was a hundred percent, but I I believe we're we're at eighty-five percent. Eighty-five percent reliability. Okay. Is that like a norm? That that is good for two thousand eighteen technology. Uh huh. Um, and we, we we look forward to benchmarking the Gillies coming in uh, next year and seeing how they do. Okay. okay thank you. Thank you both very much for that informative. That was very informative before. Now we're going to go with um, yeah, Julie. You're here, Julie Lucas, Director of Accounting. Will you go us uh, walk us through the financial report for April? Thank you. Good morning,
Debbie is going to discuss the state and federal grant revenue and the new strategic approach that PSPA is taking. Thank you, Julie. Um, one of the things that we had in this year's budget, taking yourselves back a year in time, was with the, I'll call it, is it a whole, the COVID relief funds, which is CARES, CARISA, and ARP. We were very nervous, we, we were very, that means me, very nervous that the federal government, if we didn't spend it all at one, you know, pretty quickly, would sweep it away from us to, to be able to fund the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. And clearly that is not the case. When we just went through our triennial review, FTA and our reviewer is very pleased at how quickly we are spending it, but we're not going crazy. And so they were pleased that we were basically closed out the first two, which is CARES and CARISA. One of the things that I want to do from a strategic level is on the federal side, instead of trying to draw it all in one big lump sum this year, is spread it out to better match revenues and expenses. So we'll be taking a piece of that that we would have drawn this year and apply it to next year's budget. It doesn't change how much money we draw down from the federal government. We'll still close out all of those grants. We'll just spread it out a little bit. From the state side, we had worked with the state, with FDOT, and said, well, if we're drawing all this money down from FTA, do you mind if we don't draw your money down on your grants and push them off a little bit? And one of the concerns that we had, not that we would, but one of the concerns that we had is the first F or FDOT grant would be expiring next December. It's about, um, I'm trying to even think now, it's quite a bit of money. And I want to say it's in the five plus million dollar range, somewhere in there, maybe even more than that. And what we're going to do is, you'll see on the page here, we're going to, we've started drawing down the FDOT money so that we will have that first grant all drawn down before it expires so we don't have to ask anybody for extensions, no possibility for snafus. One of the things that I found, and you can probably recall conversations even at our board meeting, with having a nice robust budgeted surplus this year, in fiscal 22 of about $41 million is we had people coming to us, suppliers coming to us, employees coming to us. We want more money, we want more money. This helps to kind of alleviate that. We still predict a surplus at the end of this year of $14 million, but we're gonna spread out the use of the COVID relief funds into two fiscal years and then finish it out next year. So I just didn't want to take you by surprise on that. And I think it'll really help on a lot of different fronts. People keep pointing to, you're gonna have a lot of money, Debbie. And it's like, well, maybe three years from now we might not have as much. I don't wanna spend it now. Thank so, you. Did you wanna talk about the expenses? Sorry for hogging the time, Julie. You're quite all right. You said that much better than I would have been able to say. <laughs> um, expenses came in at 714,000, unfavorable to budget due partially to the soaring fuel costs that we've been hearing about, leaving us at 242,000 over budget. Also attributing was a change in the methodology for recording our general liability expense. We are unfavorable to budget 296,000, but are now consistent with the actuarial recommendation year to date. In the past, you would have seen this adjustment in one lump sum every September. And now we're accounting for it in the proper month, and the April was the catch-up month. So going forward, there will be just a normal, smaller adjustment every month for that. Turning to the April year to date, we finished with a surplus of 46 million, but we're 438,000 unfavorable to budget. On the revenue side, passenger fares are unfavorable to budget by 786,000, and the property tax timing is smoothing out at 68,000 favorable to budget. Federal grants are 2.9 million unfavorable to budget year to date, and that was a lot of what Debbie was speaking about earlier. Is there anything else no, to add on that? But our state grant, you'll continue to see that go up on a year-to-date basis. 
So what we're going to do, if I can just jump in, is cap off our federal usage of the COVID funds instead instead of 61 million at 32.6 million. Increase the use of the state funds and still come up with a surplus of about 14 million this year. So fuel prices are driving the year-to-date unfavorable variance and expenses. Purchase transportation has is continuing to follow the trend of being under budget, about 1.1 million. And here also, staff is controlling expenses the best they can on what they can. Does anyone have any questions on April's financial? Doesn't appear so. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Julie. Oh, where are we next? We have yeah, Brad Miller, our CEO, going to talk about ridership and performance. Great. Yeah, so in your packet are two, um, and in front of you is uh, the ridership report, too. The ridership was up again in May. We think probably because of gas prices, I would imagine. Also spring break a little bit, but um, still looking pretty good there on the ridership. Um, you know, we have greater expenses with the fuel uh, going up, but we also have ridership uh, increases as well. Uh, and you can see again, and as we discussed last month, we are, uh, Reed Powers, our planner and I are working on a new and improved uh, uh, data sheet, but you can see on the access and mobility basically a drop in access paralleled by a significant rise in mobility programs, uh, okay. the mobility programs. So it's basically switching from most of it is access rides that are now being taken by the mobility on demand program. That's what that's that's mm -hmm. what's happening there. The other form in your packet is the uh, access uh, um, tracking um, sheet, and that's why um, I think Bonnie, if you're there on the Zoom, you can correct anything I say wrong. There's some positive and some negative things, but I think this is a really good tracking sheet to just keep us on track. The ridership is, as you can see, that orange line at the very top is going up, is now exceeding uh, the blue line, which means that that's the mobility on demand program exceeding the access. The complaints are down, which is good. And the on-time performance is showing a positive uh, trend. On the software milestones, and uh, Bonnie, you can correct what you, maybe I'm saying this wrong. <coughs> the manual trip assignments is the next milestone in the implementation of the spare software, which is very important as uh, Commissioner uh, Cox knows to allow dispatchers of First Transit to basically take over, go, go manual, uh, and uh, assign trips um, as needed. First Transit apparently has requested to prioritize the dynamic driver brakes um, ahead of the manual uh, trip assignments. So that's why I think Bonnie has shown this in red, because we're going to actually do the dynamic driver brakes first. Is that right, Bonnie? Yeah. Yeah, I actually uh, just ended a call trying to double uh, meetings here uh, with uh, First Transit and Tom Tibbetts had mentioned uh, that driver brakes is really the most important thing to them. We also had uh, the First Transit Innovation Team here uh, Monday and Tuesday of this week. So we may be looking at shifting some of the priorities uh, with SPARE and how you know we're going to approach the, the different fixes um we have a, another big meeting with um this thursday um to go through what what spare has been working on but yes long way of saying driver brakes is, is what we're hoping to put all of our resources with spare but how, how would you say overall to the to the schedule maybe, maybe some of these milestones might shift around a little bit but how is how would you describe this schedule uh, overall yeah so I, I think we're, we're going to, I, I talked with Debbie about this yesterday by the next meeting our next finance committee meeting I really think we'll have driver brakes in place um, if, if not in place then testing it out um, or, or slowly rolling that out 
um, by our next meeting. Um, and then after that, I think once that's in place, then focusing more on the manual trip assignments. But when we meet next month, we'll have the, and that most important piece uh, in place, meal okay. breaks. Okay, so um, not to interrupt you, but um, the manual trip assignments um, would be targeted for when? You said the end of next month, is that correct? End, end of July? Yeah, we don't we don't have a, a date yet for the manual trip assignments. Uh, when we talk to Spare about this, I think they want to make sure that the driver meal breaks goes well, and if there's anything we need to do um, to fix that, we focus on that first, mm -hmm. and then as, as soon as we feel comfortable with that, we'll move to the manual trip assignments. May I jump in? Because I can't yeah. help myself. Um, you know, one of the things that in the prioritization of this, as we said, by next month, you'll see something very positive that the driver breaks will be done. Uh, the manual trip assignments are being worked on, but as we pri as we optimize the algorithms within the spare software, you will have less need for the manual overrides. So I think the best thing to do is optimize the software <coughs> for PSTA, and then you know that becomes as much of a priority as the manual overrides to make sure it works. There will always be a need for a manual yep. override. I can tell you that right now. Yeah. I mean, that's just based on experience, and um, so I'm sure hoping that moves, you know, that, that we moving. see that data move. Well, the good thing is, as you can see also on the chart, we're not paying them. You know, the, they, they are still owed $1.5 million, $1.4 million that they are, it's a carrot to, well, to get this stuff done. Right. That's, um, that's half of... The first year is essentially what what we owe them, correct? We're not going to pay them anymore until it's done. That, that one point, the remaining balance of the money. Well, that's that's a good um, care, that's a good care. You know, not um, getting not getting paid to do something that's good. Yeah. So that incentivizes someone to get something done. The the other the other piece, and I know we're running some, Jerry. We've added to this chart as a as a new chart at the very bottom of the chart uh -huh. about about the performance because there's some keys to the way in which our contract with First Transit is set up. Uh -huh. We no longer pay per ride, we pay per hour. Right, and So right, it's important right. for them to be efficient in their rides. Unfortunately, they're not so efficient. They are, and that's partly perhaps the software and right. part of some other things. Um, our goal is 0.85 rides per hour, right. and they're, they're not getting there yet. The other thing is user, their subcontractor is, is doing far fewer trips than they propose and that is that is an important factor that we want to keep monitoring because we paid that the contract had the, the rates for a user would be a lot lower right. than they were for first transit and then they're not they're well, not able to do that but how can that get fixed um, because it needs to get fixed and it does and then and I mean that's because now we have our subcontractors overseeing a subcontractor yeah. and, and that would essentially be up to our subcontractor to get that done and um, yeah that's it, it's a, it's that's a, actually horrible 51% uh, and the goal is 90% yeah yeah um, now the two things and then, well, who, who's doing that well the override would be being done by first transit in a van essentially or the, the, yeah. they have a big um, <coughs> Like 15 seat, or I've seen that out out in the field too. And then like, apparently yellow or metros doing the other. Thank, thank God for Bay Area Metro. Yeah. They they have stepped up uh, uh, in a big way and basically taken a large chunk of what user is not doing um, mm -hmm. by uh, by taxi. Yeah, I almost think it's something we need to look at. But, um, we do. I'm, I'm serious. I mean. Uh, about our ambulatory trips to get that done in a more efficient way um, yeah. and because it costs less money you know for a single vehicle you know a sedan to pick up people in a van or a 
a large vehicle. And it's something I know Bonnie uh, talks to First Transit on on a daily or weekly or daily basis, so, and and yeah. user. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's all yeah. I got on that. It's just good that we're tracking. Just them. keep working on it. I appreciate it, Bonnie, and appreciate it, Julie, appreciate it. Yeah, we actually, uh, Thursday, we've got two meetings with First Transit and Spare. So, it definitely, and, you know, we had uh, First Transit here this week. I think that was really helpful. And, you know, ha having to help to get us moving more in the right direction, I think it's going to be great. Okay. I'd like to talk to you. I can bring it up. Yeah, we can do Yeah. Okay. Um, Where, where am I? Other business right here. Does any committee member have any other business to bring before this uh, committee? Absolutely. Go Tampa Bay Lightning. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Josh, you got anything? Now we're going to adjourn the meeting. You're good. So okay, we're adjourning the meeting. We got to start another right. one. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you, all. Mr. Great job. Great job. Thank you. You want to swap? Josh, you want to sit? I'll, I'll just stay right here. It's fine. No, Josh, you can move.